All right. So folks, again, welcome. This is the Binghamton University Open House, and this session is the admissions experience. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, Tanya and I are going to go ahead and introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about our roles and, and what we're doing here in admissions and all that wonderful stuff. Tanya, you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, if you're just joining us, my name again is Tanya Barajas. Um, I'm an admission counselor here. More specifically, I, I do interna international admissions with Binghamton University, uh, but I work with students from all over the U.S. as well. Uh, my territories include the Americas, so that's South America, international students in U.S. high schools, and also Canada. I also provide uh, Spanish language information sessions and resources for um, students, both domestic and international. Um, and you know other resources here. So we're really excited to have you here today. I'm hoping to alleviate some of the stresses that may come along with uh, the admissions process and really frame it more as the experience that it is and really let you know uh, how uh, counselors can be partners in your admissions experience as well. Very good. And my name again is Byron Gittens. I'm a senior assistant director here at Binghamton University. I have been here now a year. I'm from New York City, Queens to be exact. Um, I'm a first gen student. My high school had about 4,000 kids in it in Jamaica, Queens. And I remember when I went to my guidance counselor, Mr. Lederman, I said, well, I'm planning on going to college. What's the next step? He sent me into the library and gave me a book that looked like a telephone book back in the day, probably in the 90s, and uh, maybe some of you sat your kids on it as like a high chair for a dinner. But um, he told me, look through this, find a college, and tell him where to mail the transcript. That was the end of it. So there was no cell phones, so technology like this was not happening, college fairs, none of that stuff. So I've been in admissions now for 11 years. It wasn't my first choice, obviously. I don't think any of us wake up and say we're going to be an admissions uh, counselor. Um, I was in corporate America, got an MBA, working in banking, working in uh, hotels, was with Hilton for several years. And then finally, um, 2008 was not a good year for many, and for-profit industries uh, had to take a cut. And so some people were sitting down looking for work, figuring out what the next step was going to be. And that's how I ended up in education, um, if you really want to know how I ended up here. And I stayed for 11 years. Uh, prior to Binghamton, I was at University of Maryland College Park, recruiting there, um, getting students from Connecticut, New York City. And before that, kind of like what Tanya is doing now, I was at UConn doing international admissions. So I was covering Southeast Asia and South America. So you have good people on this um, session with you with admissions experience, and we're really here to kind of help you out through the process. Even though some parents on here may know exactly what the ro role is of the student, what their role is and, and what the next steps are. Um, I always have to tell parents, it's the student's first experience. They've never been through this before. So it's good that they have you, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we're addressing their anxiety and their needs as well. So apologies if some of this sounds maybe a little redundant for those parents who know the process. So we're gonna go ahead and start this presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you folks. So just bear with us. Okay, so we're going to start off just again um, explaining who Binghamton is, um, and you'll see some of this as we go through it, but many of you who may not know who we are, Binghamton University is part of the SUNY system. So the State University System of New York with the universities and colleges that we have, we have the largest school system in the nation. Yes, the UC system has more bodies, but as far as the freestanding institutions, uh, we have 64 state schools and colleges, so it is the largest network of campuses out there. Uh, Binghamton is at the top there when we talk about the number one public in New York. Academic wise, um, the resources we have are similar to large uh, public flagship institutions throughout the United States. However, one more of a medium sized institution. Now, when we talk about the experience versus the process, um, it's important to understand this is going to be a long quest to find the right uh, fit of schools for you and your student. Um, this is also going to help the student to develop as we go through this uh, process. Uh, this is more, much more of a process of checking boxes to kind of um, figure out admissions, uh, reaching out to find that perfect school that you would like to graduate from. Um, you're learning to connect with a support network 
and look deeper into your own self towards what gets you excited for the future. I mean, what are your goals? Uh, where, where do you see yourself in the next three or four years? And ideally, a college that's going to help you uh, make that impact. Now, when we get to this part here, this is more of a timeline overview. I always tell parents and students, you really have to make sure that you create a timeline, okay? Um, this is a process where there's a lot of things, a lot of pieces um, juggling around. It's not only uh, schools that you think you may want your son or daughter to go to, it may be things that they're interested in. So it's very important to have an overview, a timeline of not only the types of schools, but maybe um, understanding and being honest about finances. Uh, this is a process where sometimes I've seen parents and students, you know, the, everyone wants to jump in the driver's seat. The parents are paying for the, the um, education, so the students should be listening. So it's really a give and take. Um, but if you can sit down together and create a timeline of everything that should be happening from ninth grade on. I know on this presentation, we probably have mostly seniors and maybe there's a few juniors on here. Could be a couple of freshmen on here, I'm not sure. I've always told families that this starts in the ninth grade. This is not a process that should be starting uh, junior and senior year. I was at a college fair, I think it was the New York Big Apple Fair. Um, and a, a mother walked over to me with her daughter and said, oh, my daughter's just in ninth grade. Uh, we got plenty of time before this starts. We'll be back in a few years. We just figured we'd do some window shopping. Uh, not really. This starts in ninth grade, folks. So it's important to start building what types of schools you want to go to. So some folks say, well, how do I figure out what type? Start making a list of majors. What are some of your interests? What are some of the hobbies you're doing in high school? Do you want to go further away? Are you currently happy with the climate you're in? I mean, you can go very much into detail with a lot of this. I remember when I was on the West Coast, uh, where Tanya's from, um, I was literally talking to students in high schools that told me they wanted to be involved in medicine. And I said, um, well, have you ever thought about going to the East Coast? Well, you know, I kind of like the nice weather and everything. Well, if you're thinking about going into the healthcare industry, you, you better know, you know, some of the ailments that happen in other areas where people do get sick, um, not just by the climate of, you know, the nice weather and, and not going into like below freezing temperatures and other things that may happen in other areas. So I think it's, it's, when we talk about search and looking for different types of schools, just throw everything on paper at first. And then you can start to weed things out by size, by if they have your program, if they have the clubs and organizations that you're interested in being a part of. Do you wanna be in a suburban community? Do you wanna be in a metropolitan city? Um, these things matter. Um, the applying needs to start at some point. It's very important when you're applying you are reading dates and deadlines from all these different schools. If you have five and six schools on your list, it's imperative that we're looking at their website to determine what dates things are due, what application they're on. There's several applications out there. I know everyone tends to use the Common App, but believe it or not, our New Yorkers will use the SUNY app if they're only planning on staying in New York. And there's also the coalition application out there. So it's important to kind of make sure you know the deadlines for institutions as far as when an application's due and what's the components. Um, then the decision process will kind of happen. Um, that doesn't usually happen. Most folks know right away, but there's a national deadline, May 1st, for students to pay their deposit and make their decision, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that because there are some schools that have um, early decision which means that's a binding agreement. So if you get accepted, they're expecting you to come. Um, and then enrolling, which I kind of alluded to with the May 1st piece. Great. Um, so with regard to that admissions experience, you know, all of the things that Byron was telling you about, uh, you know, that experience is going to blossom and evolve over time. So right now it's sort of a broader experience. What we want you to really focus on are what your values are. What are your values? I think for a lot of students, sometimes their values um, are can start off as a relatively short list. And then again, that's going to develop and grow over time. Uh, I, as a high school student, you know, I wanted to make sure that the school I went to had a, a very specific kind of a niche 
major that I was looking for. Um, I wanted to make sure that it was closest to home. Uh, and what is close to home is going to be different for, for many students. For some students, a close to home means an hour away. For some students, as long as they're in the same state, <laughs> they're close to home. Uh, as long as they're on the same side of the Mississippi, they're close to home. Uh, so distance is gonna mean different things to different people. Uh, and you know, thinking about that and thinking about your values of you know, where they lie in that area is gonna be important as well. The other thing um, that I remembered, I wanted to have a particular experience of studying abroad. Uh, so that was important to me as a student at that time. So also thinking about the, you know, why you want to go to school, to college, and the experiences that you, specific experiences that you want to have when you go to college, whether that might be studying abroad or uh, being a part of a certain club or organization or getting, working with a, excuse me, a specific professor, you know, maybe you read a book that was written by one of our professors and you thought, gosh, I really want to, I want to go to school so I can learn with that person. You know, that's not unheard of. We do have students who do that. Um, or, you know, maybe it's, you want to have an, an internship and you feel like this is going to be a good program to support you in those goals. Uh, so that experience part, the admissions experience is, you know, where we are in the cycle right now. It's really about being thoughtful, being mindful about what your values are. Um, so, and then also for some students, it might be certain offices. You know, we have a number of students who are in high school right now who may not feel so comfortable um, exploring their, you know, their sexuality, for example. So having an LGBTQ office on their future college campus is going to be really important. Or having an office of students with disabilities office is going to be really important. Um, so in addition to having that major, in addition to being an academically strong institution or being very you know, well regarded, having a good reputation, having that support there, knowing that that support is there for you is going to be important to know. Uh, so that's, you know, by looking at your values, that's one of the ways that you can develop a list with exploration, you're doing it right now. So you, you are currently exploring uh, already and you can do that with, uh, open houses. We have another open house happening in November with virtual high school visits. You know, we, Binghamton University is visiting a lot of high schools virtually this fall and we will continue to do so. Um, you know, maybe your school allows for those virtual high school visits and maybe they don't. Uh, we also have virtual one-on-one -on -one appointments that students can make. We have chat hours that students can drop in on. And also social media is a great way to connect and engage uh, with the schools and institutions that you are interested in. Uh, with regard to application types, um, a question that often comes up with application types is which one is the best, right? Um, so these three application types, Common App, Coalition App, SUNY App, they all essentially function in the same way. They're third party applications uh, that service a variety of colleges and universities and uh, you know, tertiary education institutions around the US and in other countries as well. Ideal, the way that they work ideally is that you can do one and it will be good for many schools and universities, right? Um, the one that students tend to send most often is the Common App. So it's a good name for that application because it is the most common. Uh, and then the Coalition App is has maybe a little over 200 member institutions. And then SUNY application is just for SUNY schools. So neither one of these three applications is going to give you more of an edge in the uh, admissions process. You know, once you've gone through that list making period and you have your list of, you know, four, five, ten, you know, some students apply to 15 or more schools and sometimes, um, you know, you'll start to see trends. You'll start to see, OK, well, seven out of 10 of these schools, uh, it looks like they accept the common application. So you can fill out the common application and it'll go to all seven of those schools. You don't have to fill out you know, an individual application for each one. So the goal is that it reduces the amount of labor that you have to do in the application side of things. Great. 
Okay, folks, so a couple of things here, and that's why I was explaining that um, it's very important that you are looking at particular um, institutions, deadlines, you're on their admissions page, because not everyone is going to have the same type of deadline. Some folks may have uh, things that are needed in addition to an application. So it's very important. Um, I tell students, you know, you're going to start off by exploring the schools on your list and what they have to offer. I mean, when we talk about early action, early action is really um, for those students who they're going to have more power. Okay, it gives you it gives you more power. It gives you more time to make decisions on where you may be ending up. Um, early action is not binding, so please do not get that confused with early decision. Uh, where early decision again sometimes is a well, not sometimes it's a commitment to go um, to where you said you were going to go if you are choosing to be considered for early decision. Benefits of regular give students again uh, more time on the front end to gather materials, helps to avoid rush and spend more time exploring schools. Now, I will tell you this. Um, what I found with students when they are pushing for early action, depending on where they are, it could be because of an honors program. It could be because of um, these elite programs that an institution may have, whether it could be an engineering program, a nursing program, or some of these where there's limited seating. Um, first come, first serve meaning that you know the institution that you're applying to is trying to make a class, whatever that class is at that institution. Uh, for Binghamton, when you're looking at early action, this is really gonna, again, have you looked at for an elite program such as engineering, school of management, nursing, these honors programs that we have, uh, whether it's BU Source or it's even um, the freshman research immersion program where there's only four of these in the nation, um, at institutions, one of the only one in the Northeast that has it. So there's a lot of selectivity that is happening behind the scenes. Um, regular decision, everyone will still get looked at, everyone will still get reviewed, but also when people are being looked at for some sorts of monies that may be available. I mean, when the money's gone, it's gone. So that's one of the things I think early action tends to uh, help out as well. Keep in mind also, we're gonna talk about it more, but we are rolling decision. I'm bringing that up now because as I see it, if I think it's something that could help you, um, I'd like to discuss things like that. So when I talk about decisions being released, um, the, these decisions are not all happening on February 28th and everyone's gonna find out. So we have some high schools where maybe we're getting six, 700 applications. Everyone is not gonna find out the same day. Once we read an application, the committee's reviewed it and we're all set to release it, we may release it on November 22nd, okay, believe it or not. So it's gonna be rolling decision. Um, everyone that did do early action will hear by January 15th. So that's important to kind of understand that. Also, another thing I'm gonna to touch on here is decision types. There's different types of decisions that Binghamton releases. Many years ago, I know there were institutions that either you got an accept or you got a deny. And that was the end of it. There was no other option. So you just got to keep in mind Binghamton being as selective it is, as it is, being that top university in the state of New York, we get 40,000 applications for 3,000 seats. We're looking to admit people. Um, so we are able to offer more than one type of decision. It's not just admit and deny. Some students may be put on a wait list. Some students may be offered spring admission. Spring admission is not a denial. That means you're admitted and we want you at the university. Uh, some students may be admitted to our Binghamton Advantage program, okay, where they're going to take classes at SUNY Broome, but they're going to be living on the Binghamton campus for a year until they matriculate into the Binghamton uh, academics. So these are all types of admit decisions um, besides the wait list that could happen. So it's very important that students, um, you know, understand those are not denials. So I don't think anyone should be thinking that it's inferior if they didn't get a full admit. So that's one thing that I will um, tell families and students um, to kind of keep their eye open for. Um, EOP students are applying regular decision. So if you are, if you are, um, looking to be part of the EOP program, which there are some 
different things that are involved with that. This is back to making sure that you're looking at websites, you're looking at deadlines for things, because EOP has some small nuances to it that needs to happen. You have to be a New Yorker 12 months prior to applying for that program. So there's a lot of things that are tied to that. Also, when we talk about special talent, if you're looking to be part of the music program or, or some other program, there's a couple of our special talent programs that you're not to submit until January 15th. You cannot submit early action. So with that, you reach out to your admissions professional or anyone, we'll, we'll give you this stuff at the end, but admit at binghamton.edu. That's the main email that stuff comes into the admissions office. And we are there to answer those questions and make sure no one's falling behind. Okay. okay. So yeah. we're going to touch a little bit on gathering supporting materials um, as part of the admissions experience. Uh, so for all the schools that you're going to be applying to, it's likely that you're going to have to uh, submit transcripts. Um, so when you when we submit, rather when big students submit transcripts to Binghamton, we're looking at the ultimate three completed years uh, from each school attended. So that would be academic year um, 1920, academic year uh, 1819, and academic year 1718. Um, so we know that this has been a different year and you're not alone. This, is, this COVID has affected everybody. Uh, students are learning from home remotely. Um, classes have changed in some ways to pass no pass. And pass no pass means different things to different schools. You know, for some schools, pass is a, above a 70%. For some schools, it's above a 60 or 65. Uh, so, you know, this is information that we're going to get also from your school and from your counselors, the ways in which they have adjusted uh, for, you know, for COVID and, and the, the ways in which, um, you know, students are still meeting uh, the requirements for those classes and how they're doing that at home. So we are going to look at those three uh, recently completed years. And we're also looking at trends. If you have any uh, dips in your transcripts, you can feel free to let us know. Um, you know, don't shy away. If you had a, a chemistry class that didn't quite work out, you know, maybe that's not your strength. That's okay. <laughs> that's nothing to, to be ashamed of. Feel free to address it head on. Let us know. Um, you know, what happened and how you uh, overcame that, maybe if you did, you know, if you were able to take it again or get tutoring or just decided, you know, maybe I'm not meant for chemistry and I've moved on and this is what I'm doing now. That's totally fine. Letters of rec. Um, so you want to give your recommenders plenty of time to get this ready for you. Uh, I would say about two weeks at the latest um, to between when you ask them and uh, when they can provide it for you. And then of course, after you get a letter of recommendation, you must certainly uh, say thank you to them. You know, I think from a remote, since we're all remote now, or many students are continue to be remote, uh, a thank you email would be uh, appropriate as well. So who should this recommender be? It should be somebody, uh, either a counselor or uh, a teacher who knows you very well, knows your work well, uh, and can really attest to your potential to succeed in a university environment and your potential potential to contribute to that environment as well. As well. So typically a, recommender, uh, a letter of recommendation is maybe like one page or a few paragraphs long. Um, we at Binghamton only require one letter of recommendation. Um, so students can submit more if they want to. Sometimes students have more just because other colleges that they're applying to require more than one. Uh, you don't have to. At, at the end of the day, if you feel like it's something that we need to have in order to understand you better as a student, then go ahead and submit it. But as far as requirements for Binghamton, we only require one. With SAT scores, uh, so in prior years, SAT or ACT were uh, required uh, for students to apply to Binghamton University. But we recognize that a lot of students have been affected by COVID. They haven't been able to sit for those SAT or ACT exams or their exams are getting canceled. And so we're not gonna penalize any students for not having SAT or ACT scores. Um, that is going to be optional 
uh, for this coming year. And actually all the SUNY campuses have gone uh, SAT, ACT test optional for the coming year. Um, now let's say you do have scores and you are very proud of them and you want to submit them, you can go ahead and submit them, that will be fine. Um, but you, if you don't want to submit them, you will not be penalized in any way. Remember that SAT and ACT scores, this is just an extra, extra piece of information. Um, you, this is just a little bit more to, to let us know uh, how you are uh, academically as a student. And a student who submits SAT or ACT scores isn't going to be advantaged over another student who doesn't just because they have them. Um, so, you know, we do give you that option, you know, for some students, they, they have scores from a year ago uh, that they are quite proud of and they feel like, you know, they want us to see that so we can know them a little bit better. Uh, there are going to be other requirements if you are applying to something like EOP, uh, or, you know, they have additional documents that you would need to submit. If you're a homeschooled student, you know, we need some additional documents from you. Uh, ROTC, uh, we don't need documents for if you're interested in ROTC, but maybe you want to get in touch uh, with our ROTC representatives, we can help you to connect with them. Uh, talent, we do also have opportunities for students to submit uh, a supplementary talent form, whether that's for painting or drawing or photography or theater or for music, uh, you can do something like that as well. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, all these uh, supporting materials, your application, you know, we're, we're looking at it all together. We're trying to get a better sense of who you are. And we're trying to assess, you know, if we bring the student to the campus, are they going to be okay here, you know? So, Typically, if you're getting A's and B's in your, in your high school, you're probably going to get A's and B's at Binghamton University. Um, and if there's anything, any anomalies or things that you want to explain, we're happy to hear you out. Yeah, and, and thanks for that, Tanya. And I'm just going to reiterate what Tanya said, because I do know that that's something that is constantly coming in with questions. Um, when you have a university that has constantly had certain pieces of the puzzle that were used in factoring decisions, um, that standardized testing on, you know, how you feel about it. Some students are asking questions, should they submit it? Should they not submit it? It's really up to the student and the family to make that decision. Um, it's not for us. Like Tanya said, we have other factors we are looking at to admit. We will be looking at students uh, transcript, which I'm going to go into now. But um, as far as test optional, if, if, if you're on the fence and not really having a clear, concise picture, if you should or if you should not, I tell some students, you know, look at the academic profile of this institution for the previous year, if it's something that's always been part of that application, because Binghamton, we're not test blind. So if it is submitted, it is going to be part of the review process. Um, if you're wondering what our profile was last year, the middle 50% was 1300 to 1450 with the math and verbal on that SAT and ACT was 29 to 32. So obviously 25% had less than that middle 50%, but we will look at you for business, for engineering, nursing, um, you know, some of the monies that we may have as far as merit base without the standardized test. So again, that is up to the student and family. Do not have anxiety over it. Um, no one's going to be penalized for not submitting. I will tell you, though, if you are submitting that um, test score or not, there is a new part of this application, and it may come up later on, but the uh, declaration sheet, a student does need to indicate whether or not they are submitting test scores. Once you make that decision that you're doing it, that decision's final. Um, early action, I, I kind of mentioned this, the students for early action applying by November 1, you have till December 1 to submit supporting documents, whether it's the council recommendation, whether it's the declaration page, which is new this year, or the standardized test, you do have to say yes or no. Application's incomplete until you make that decision. So you have to December 1st to make sure you have that into us, um, your final supporting um, information, okay? Now, the transcript. Um, I kind of talked about it at the beginning. This starts in ninth grade. Um, so we are getting a transcript 
We will not be just pulling GPAs off a transcript and we're good to go. Uh, there's all sorts of um, GPAs out there and, and I've seen some, depending on where you are, someone telling me us, this is a six point scale and this is a 108.5 and everything. We look at things to really be at a hundred scale. You know, we look at AP courses uh, for the extra weighting. We look at honors, we look at college level work. Okay, some of these schools have IB curriculum, international baccalaureate uh, curriculum that students are taking. The exams are totally up to you if you're looking for credit, but we're looking at the transcript to make sure there is rigorous coursework. Now, Tanya, I think mentioned it before, if you go to multiple high schools or you were somewhere else, we need all these transcripts. We need to see a freshman year, a sophomore year, and a junior year. We understand there's different countries sometimes that students may have come from and the transcripts are different. We've both seen that um, from our professional end, so we know how that works. But we wanna see a complete secondary um, school um, of coursework happening from beginning to end. By the time you submit your transcript to us, we'll see course in progress uh, for your senior year. So we'll see what you're taking, but we are gonna be reviewing 9th, 10th and 11th. Freshman year, Obviously, depending on you know um, how students adapt to a high school, it may have been rough. So we can tell what an upward trend is. We can tell freshman year may have been rocky. Then look at this grade tenth, eleventh grade. We can also tell what happened uh, to these seniors last semester, possibly um, when COVID had happened and all sorts of things were going on in a household. So we can, we, we've been doing this for several years. This isn't the first time we've seen transcripts or we've been able to tell. So we do peel the onion to try to find out what's going on in this transcript. However, if you see something that you know we're gonna see and have questions about and it's not explainable, I would encourage you to reach out to your admissions counselor or to at least make sure it's covered. I know in the Common App this year, there's a special spot for COVID because some folks have had some tragedies in their life. You know, could have been economical. Um, when we talk about that, it could have been losing somebody. Um, and they, they, there could have been a lot of things that have happened with, with, with um, people. So there is a spot for that if something has impacted you and, and you really need to discuss it. You don't have to use your essay for that, for that portion. Um, we're gonna be looking at high schools in the context. Not every high school has AP courses. Not every high school will have rigor. Um, they're doing the best they can and that's the end of it. So we're looking at schools in the context of what they offer, what the student did. Sometimes the, the counselor may say, nope, you can't take any AP courses till you're a junior and you can take one, then you can load up senior year. And we'll see that, we'll see it in the profile. Your counselors usually send us a profile so we'll know exactly what's going on in the high school. Most of us are in the territory so we know the high schools, especially if we live in that community. Some of us are regional, so we're based in certain areas and we do not live in Broome County or at Binghamton. So we'll know what's really happening in the school to kind of understand the transcript, but you're encouraged to reach out to us as well. Um, we don't wanna see, um, and this, we don't really need to get too heavily into this, but some students get senioritis. After they get an admissions decision, there could be some, uh, you know, us not getting what we bargained for, students dropping classes that they that we saw were in progress, changing of schedules happening, um, grades going downward after they get the decision. Just try to continue to be professional where that's concerned. Um, you know, no one wants to have you know admissions rescinded uh, based on what was uh, being offered, and now they're not getting it. So it's just important to understand. You know, do the best you can. We understand students weren't always strong when they got in high school. We see it all the time. And a lot of that has to do with commuting. Some folks may ride the train an hour away to get to a specialized high school, or maybe their parents are having them leave a community to go to another advanced community. So we, we're looking at a whole host of things. Not one transcript is gonna do it for us. We're looking at counselor recommendations, teacher recommendations, extracurricular activities that happen. There's a whole host of things we're looking to make an admissions decision. So I don't want you to get hung up on some of this stuff that I'm mentioning. Uh, so after you click submit, uh, you know, the process or rather the admissions experience uh, is not quite over. You know, there it comes in waves. So 
once you click submit, you want to make sure that you're still uh, in contact with the colleges and universities that you have applied to. Uh, many of them will send, you know, will send you communications. They'll send you a confirmation that they've received your email. They may ask you to activate a particular portal that's unique to that uh, college university, we have what's called a status checker. So when students apply to Binghamton University, they do receive uh, an email confirmation and they and within that confirmation, they're also prompted to set up their status checker, you know, creating a username, creating a password, things like that. Uh, there are different timelines for different things as I we had gone over before, you know, you may have a list of schools that you're ready to apply to. Some you may do early action, some you do, may do regular. Um, so you may be in different stages of a process, but clicking submit for some and not yet for others. Uh, I think, you know, with what students are going through right now, we are in mid-October, we're heading towards, um, you know, midterms for a lot of high school students later on, we're gonna be getting into uh, final exams. So your inbox is probably quite full, not only from communications that colleges and universities are sending to you, uh, but also from communications that you're getting from your own high school. <laughs> so what I would recommend highly and uh, is to have two separate uh, email accounts, one for just your high school, and then one for just applying to colleges and universities that, that and you need to check them both frequently. Uh, but part of this presentation today is to help diminish a little bit of your stress. And I think that that really does help a lot of students diminish their stress because they're not uh, confronted with 40, 50 emails per day from the various colleges and universities that they're um, communicating with. So if you can have that live in, a, in another email, that's going to help your stress level a little bit. And it's going to help you to stay uh, somewhat organized as well. So you want to make sure uh, that you have that separate email, that you continue to check it, and that you follow up with anything that is recommended. Uh, for example, some students, we do uh, have them, they apply early action and they feel like, great, I'm done. Now I'm just going to wait and, and it'll be fine. Um, and then they don't check their email and they don't realize that actually the college university has asked for additional information. So you wanna make sure that you do check those. Uh, finding right fit. Yes. So when we talk about fit folks, um, and, and I don't think this could be talked about enough. And, and the reason we're, we, we um, are saying that is because, I mean, we see it all the time when we're talking to students. Last year, we were on the road traveling and we travel all over. And it's not one place. I mean, Tanya's jet setting all over the world. I mean, not right now, but she's all over the place. And it's the same thing. Students are looking to understand with all these university and colleges, how do I determine? They're hearing the same thing. They're hearing this and that. You have to do a couple of things. And I think one of the main thing is making that list that we talked about in the beginning, finding what you want in a university. That's the first thing. And when we talk about what we want, do we want a big school? Do we want a lot of sports? Do we want to have an honors program? Do we want to make sure that the campus is diverse? Do we want a school that has an engineering college on it? Do they have the pre-programs? And when I talk about the pre, the pre-med, the pre-dental, the pre-health, the pre-pharmacy, the pre-law, I mean, to get you ready for a graduate program. What's the retention rate? Are these students coming back next year? I mean, luckily we have a 92% retention rate. What's the average starting salary? Are people making just the national average of 52,000 when they leave the university? Or are they making $60,398, which is Binghamton's average? So it's not all about just money and those things. But usually for a student, when they're making their list and then they have like 50 schools that they're, they're looking at, we need to then start looking at ROI. And if you're not doing it, the parents will definitely be doing it. Making sure there's graduation rates, making sure that there's average starting salaries, making sure that there's a lot of alumni to help propel the student into that focus, making sure there's internship opportunities, making sure the professors, there's distinguished professors there, or at least folks that uh, know what they're talking about. 
and looking at a pattern of what has happened with people that have went there prior to my son or daughter showing up there. What was the student outcome? So I think that is a helpful thing in finding fit. Another thing yes. is we have to be honest with the, with the dorming situation. Um, what we wanna see for housing um, as far as, um, is it newer dorms? Is it, is it, am I gonna have a roommate? Of course, most people are, but are there communities? One thing I will say about Binghamton that I think is great. And you know, I'm not pushing Binghamton today. I mean, we'd like you all to come, but um, I've worked at other places. Uh, one thing I will say is unique is the dorming situation. These are themed houses, if you will. Some of you seen Harry Potter. Well, that's what we're talking about, where there's traditions, themes, collegiate professors tied. Uh, one dorm college in the woods, they host a casino night every single year, where they have all of these tables they get, permits, and then they take the money and use it to go towards a charity of their choosing. Uh, so that that's something to, to kind of think about, whether or not you're one of those people that are an extrovert or introvert, or you're nervous about meeting new people. One thing I will say, especially in this world of social distancing, this campus is 930 acres with a nature preserve of 180 acres, six acre pond. I mean, there's a lot of spreading out on this campus. You're not gonna have 20, 30,000 kids though. It's only 7,600 students that live here and our undergraduate population's 14,000. Uh, Binghamton's going to be in the hills. So if you come from Queens like I do, just know you're going to be in a suburban community. This is um, a college town. This is not, um, you know, anything you're going to see that's going to look like downtown Boston or Miami, Florida, or, you know, um, the Upper East Side. Tanya, you want to talk a little bit about the community? Yeah, absolutely. So the Binghamton University community where we live, it's kind of the best of both worlds in that students do have access to that beautiful nature. Um, right behind where we are, uh, we do have a little over 180 acres of natural land, part of our nature preserve, which includes 11 miles of hiking, over 200 species of birds, and just a beautiful place to watch the four seasons uh, go by um, and kind of evolve. And it is very different. I mean, I, I think uh, there's about a five to 10 degree difference from Binghamton, uh, the greater Binghamton area, uh, and maybe uh, New York City. And my in-laws are, are in Brooklyn area. So when I go to them, I do notice that there is a climate um, difference there. Part of that too is because we have two large rivers that meet here in the greater Binghamton area, the Susquehanna and the Shenango River. So there's a lot of water and then all that water creates a lot of greenery, uh, which is really beautiful. And then, you know, it is the best of both worlds because we're not in a secluded space either. Uh, greater Broome County where Binghamton is located is home to a little over 190,000 uh, residents. Uh, so it's quite a sizable population and it's enough to support, you know, our downtown center where we have restaurants and cafes. Uh, we have a minor league baseball team, a minor league hockey team. We have Tri-Cities Opera Company. We have Broadway shows that come through um, and we have festivals and events that take place all uh, through the year. So you do have a lot of activity on and off campus um, and that wonderful, you know, access to nature as well. So here, folks, we just kind of want to make sure, and then we're going to open it up to some questions and answers. Uh, so feel free at this time to start typing things inside the, um, the chat is not working for you, but you can put it in the Q&A box. The chat is disabled. So just use the Q&A box, maybe start putting some questions you have in there. Um, I will tell you, we are having another open house starting in November. So make sure you're, be, you're on the lookout for that. It's important that if your son or daughter is not getting emails from us at Binghamton, that they literally are on our mailing list. The way they do that is request information. They can go right on the website and kind of sign up for that to make sure that they're getting information from us. But we're going to go ahead and stop sharing screen now. And we are back. So we are here now to answer any questions. I did have a couple that I... Um, saw online. So I'm just going to go through and kind of just maybe, you know, touch on these and then we can get into the Q&A box. Um, I think we talked about admissions as a whole and, and the experience. 
and a, and went into the process a little bit. The essay again, I, I I know people get nervous about the essay. You have a lot of options for your essay. Just make sure that when you do the college essay, um, you are really that's your interview. Binghamton is not holding interviews. It's impossible with the amount of applicants we are going to be talking to, and it's not fair to do for some and then not do for all. So your application is your interview. It is how we are gonna get to know you. It's important that that essay, whatever topic you choose, you are trying to capture a reader. You are thinking about what you're writing. You're passionate about what you're writing. You are trying to convey, um, whereas if the person you let read it, and it's not always gonna be your parent. Maybe they can start, but it really should be someone who maybe doesn't know you. You know, work with that on your parent because the parent is too close to the situation. You need some people we're going to be objective to what they're reading and really get a feel of seeing a story and, and some emotion happening by it. And people can do that with a sports essay. You can do it with, with the student government essay, whatever it is that you're passionate about. So make sure you're getting some folks to kind of help you with that. Um, Tanya, there was another one here. Does Binghamton believe there is value in exploring different majors before choosing? You know, I'm not going to answer that as Binghamton University. I'm going to answer that as Tanya Barajas. Yep. Um, and I would say uh, that it, if you do something like that, explore, you should do it because it's your value, not because it's the university or the college that values that. Um, when you apply to Binghamton University, we are going to evaluate your application um, as part of the school. Uh, so we have our six schools, Harper College of Arts and Sciences, School of Management, uh, School of Engineering, College of Community Public Affairs, um, and also uh, Decker College of Nursing, and then the Pharmacy School, which is more of a grad school. Um, so, you know, we do have students who come to us who are like, psychology, I'm a psychology major, that's what I'm going to do, it's going to be great, and I'm all over it. And then they come and they are exposed to something that they had never considered, and they're like, I'm not interested in psychology anymore. I want to change my major. And that's fine. You know, you know, that's fine to, to do. And then we have students who are very honest. They're like, you know what? I, I am really into STEM. I'm not quite sure like which one of the sciences I want to do. To, and I don't really want to make that commitment right now. So I'm going to come in undecided. I'm going to look at chemistry, but I'm also going to look at uh, bio. That's fine too. You know, that's totally fine. Um, I think the value that we're trying to impart here, particularly with this session, is that you really look in and see what it is that that you value. Um, the other, I think the other side of that, that I'm going to read into that question too, uh, is that we get a lot of students who ask, does it look bad if I apply undecided? Uh, it doesn't. We, we don't look at a student who applies undecided and go, they don't know what they want. We, you know, we we look at that student. We're like, okay, you know, they're coming and they're excited to be here on our campus. They're excited with, with what we're offering, and you know, they're they're ready to take a look around and, and see see what's good. Um, and that's fine. That's to we admit so many undecided students, and that is totally fine. Um, I just wanted to share. No, that was great. Um, I, I, now this I'm going to just hit on really quickly because I think we hit on this enough with the SAT and ACT, at least where we think we kind of conveyed it enough. But again, it's really up to um, your family what you choose to do with this test optional situation. Um, again, I will tell you when you're looking at an academic profile of institution, if it was me, I'm just speaking like if it was me now at this point, if I'm applying to an institution and I know that the institution is test optional, but they're not test blind, meaning that if I submit an SAT score and it's part of the application now, and that it will be considered in the review process, doesn't mean that it's gonna penalize you. I wouldn't submit something that is way out of the range of what that profile was the year before. So let me give you an example. If it was me and I was submitting my SAT scores to Binghamton or whomever, and they told me the middle 50% was 1300 to 1450. I personally would not be submitting an 1100 SAT, especially if it's test optional. I just wouldn't do it. You know, if it's 1300, sure. If it's 1250, sure. Even 1200, maybe I would. But it's, it's really up to you, the family. I know that question came up. So I just wanted to touch on that again to kind of leave people with an ease on that one. 
Um, I see something about, is there a maximum number of college credits accepted from a high school? So that comes up occasionally with students, and we do have some high schools in New York City and other places where students are leaving with an associate's degree, okay? They're literally getting 60 credits and so on. Um, they're coming in advanced standing, those students, unless they've complete, when you do high school, um, when you do post credits after high school graduation, that allows you to come in as a transfer student. Um, students are getting, taking college um, classes in high school, whether it's dual curriculum through another institution um, prior to getting the high school diploma. That just helps you to come in advanced standing. So that's the difference with that. And you won't come in here with 90 credits, impossible, but we've seen students coming in here with 60 credits. We also have to make sure there's enough to count towards general education as well. Yeah, um, um, I just wanted to expand to on, on that a little bit too. Um, so I think that the key thing that Byron shared was after high school graduation. So we have a lot of students who are taking AP uh, or international baccalaureate or dual enrollment courses while they're still in high school. Um, so that this question comes up every year, you know, am I a first year student or am I a transfer student because I have these credits? So you're only considered a transfer student if you've earned uh, college credits after you've graduated from high school. So you've completed high school. That doesn't mean that you won't have credits that transfer over. Um, you know, we do, we are quite generous actually with the number of credits that we do transfer over. If you're taking AP exams, uh, and you get a three or a five, three, three, two, five, not a three or a five, you can get a four, <laughs> two, three, four or five. Uh, you know, that's worth roughly like four credits depending on, on the exam that you take. For inter international baccalaureate, if you're taking high level exams in international baccalaureate and you earn uh, a four or five, that's about four credits. A six or a seven is worth about eight. And then we also um, transfer some credit over for A level, so if you're doing Cambridge curriculum, uh, as well. Um, so these aren't as, advan ad as advantageous to you in the admissions part as it is after you have been admitted and you're enrolling, because then that's where you see the fruit of that labor. You get those credits. And um, from the admission side and in the beginning side, we're like, oh, okay, you know, they're, they're challenging themselves with these classes. That's, that's really good. So we, uh, regardless of what curriculum you're in, this is something that Byron mentioned before, every school is different. We're looking at you in the context of your school. We wanna see that you're both uh, doing well in the curriculum that you're in and challenging yourself with what you have access to. Right, and um, thank you for that, Tanya. I saw someone had put something in here about um, a major that you will not see at Binghamton. Like we don't have an interior design program, but there are some components here um, that with certain majors, we can create a major. So. Um, I know one component when we start talking about interior design, we do have to have some sketching ability, some graphic design and things of that nature. We do have an art and design program. So certainly you can reach out to us. We can certainly put you in touch with the advising office. We wouldn't wanna tell you, yes, you can certainly create an interior design program here, but there are a lot of majors that we have at Binghamton. Some of them were created through Harper College of Arts and Sciences because they have so many different options in there where they can create a major of where students are looking to do something specifically that may not be listed. Obviously it has to be approved um, by the professors, the PhD professors and a panel. But in Harper, we do have some art and design programs where that could be a possibility. Um, one other thing I saw in here again, back to that test optional part, um, are the declaration letters for test optional part of the Common App. No, this is something specifically from Binghamton. So when you apply to us, one thing that is added this year, which is a requirement to complete your application, is the declaration sheet where you will indicate, yes, I'm sending SAT scores or ACT scores. No, I am not uh, sending SAT or ACT scores. So your option, but your application will not be complete until you complete that form in the app checker. And for those who wanna, again, wait till December 1st, if you're early action, you have till December 1st to complete all supporting documents, including that declaration page that's there. So again, um, don't panic over this. We've made decisions on other things. Yes, the test was required, but not everyone always had the highest SAT score or fell within that uh, middle 
we are looking at other things to admit, but that form is required and it's not coming from Common App, that's specifically coming from Binghamton. Um, Tanya, one question that was here um, was what is unique about the Decker College of Nursing that sets it apart from other nursing programs? I mean, I know we're ranked number 14 in the state, but do you wanna share anything? Uh, I would say, you know, Decker College of Nursing is a direct entry program. Uh, so that's not, while it's not unique, uh, there's a lot of programs, nursing programs within the United States where it's kind of a provisional admission where you're admitted and then you have to complete some coursework or some other things. And then uh, the school will decide if you can continue forth with, uh, with that nursing program or not. Uh, so our Decker School of Nursing isn't that way. You know, you are, if you're admitted, you're admitted, you're in the program, you're in Decker School of Nursing. Um, in general, Decker enrolls about 50 uh, first year uh, students and about 50 transfer students every year, which includes both sophomore and junior transfers. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people who are applying to nursing don't realize that, that they could actually apply as sophomores. They feel like they have to get uh, lots of courses complete and then apply as a junior. You can still apply as a transfer student as well. And then uh, our Decker School also has B, a BAT program, which stands for a Baccalaureate Accelerated Track. So this is designed for students who have an undergraduate degree in a, in a different area, not nursing, something else, but they want to go into nursing. Uh, this is you know, something that they can apply to. Uh, the prerequisite, though, is that they have to already have a degree. So that's a little bit about our nursing program. Very good. And the last question we have here, folks, and then we'll be mindful of time to wrap up and let you enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Um, does Binghamton track demonstrated interest? So I'll tell you this, we can see it. I mean, it's no secret. We can see um, who's looking at emails. We can see who has an interest in Binghamton. We can see um, who's reaching out. We can see who's signing up for these events. Absolutely. It's not a main factor in our decision-making process. This is not what's going to do it for us. I mean, we're looking at a whole host of things, but yeah, we'd like to see someone who's interested in Binghamton. If there's two seats left, I mean, and we have four people, I mean, and this person, and everything's pretty much equal there, you know, it's what we want on campus. I mean, someone who has a strong interest, I mean, why not? So I would just say, yeah, we want, you know, um, we don't want to see an essay, and this has happened to me, where it comes over, and it says, you know, all these great things about the university. And then it closes with, I'm looking forward to being at the University of Michigan. I mean, that, we don't want to see that. So I would say interest is important, but I mean, we, 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 we really just are combing through students, making sure that we are who you want and, you know, we want you. So we are putting a fit together here. Just as much as you're interested in us, we're interested in you as well. Um, last question we'll take. Um, I think it was back to that declaration sheet again. It's in the app checker. So when the student submits their application, it's inside the checker. The students will have access to see their checklists. They will see what's missing, what needs to be completed. And it's right there where they would go and make that decision. Again, if you want to take till December 1st to make that decision, if you're an early action applicant, go for it. But what I do want to let you know is once you make that decision, that's it. Unless a testing center closed on you or something happened like that, um, we, we need to make sure that students understand once you decide, that's it. Okay. Um, so we've come to the hour. I uh, just wanted to say thank you so much for being with us today. It's a beautiful Saturday hope, here in Binghamton. Hopefully it's beautiful where you are too. Um, we know that there's a lot that you could be doing uh, with this time right now. So we really appreciate that you took the time out of your day to learn more about Binghamton. And, you know, hopefully what we shared with you uh, makes you feel empowered. Uh, again, you know, a lot of times uh, students and families might see counselors as like the gatekeepers of the university. And we're not, we want to be partners. Uh, so there is no, um, you know, there is no limits on to the number of questions that you can ask that we would be happy to answer for you. Uh, so I, go, I went ahead and put our email in the chat. It's admit at binghamton.edu. Uh, so feel free to email us if you do have further questions and to look out uh, for our upcoming events that we may have. So thank you so much. 
and have a great day. Take care, folks.